Thank you, Aaron, for coming in to help us set up. Um, we are going to spend a little bit more time eating snacks, getting to know folks at your table, setting up this wonderful laptop, um, and we'll plan to go ahead and start Regina's workshop uh, around 3.20. Um, I did have a few folks who were saying, where's the bathroom and where am I? And why is the museum closed on Google Maps? Um, my name is Janine Pollard. I work here at MIA. I'm also a member of the Minnesota Access Alliance Board, so I'm your host for today. Um, MIA is actually closed on Monday to the public, but this space is open for us to meet, um, so the galleries are not open. Uh, I did want to mention that the bathroom, our gender neutral bathrooms, are out this door here. If you turn left and go down the hallway, um, you'll see them on your right. Um, and other than that, if you have any questions, let me know. We'll get ready to go shortly. Thank you. Hello, hello, go ahead and sit down. A little bit scary, a little bit nerve-wracking, but how do you feel? You know, being able to meet someone that you don't know and speak with them in a language that you're not familiar with. Were you nervous? Mm -hmm. Oh, do I remember how to spell my name? <laughs> <laughs> How'd you feel? Let's get a few few points here. I um, I have vision issues, so. I have to pick up the thing and do like that and still try to do that. So that was pretty awkward for me. Understood. Completely understood. Uh, any others? Any other expressions? <laughs> that's okay. That's a normal feeling. That's a very normal feeling. Just the awkwardness that comes across. You know, I don't want to look like I'm too goofy. Maybe I'm saying something wrong and, you know, I don't want to mess everything up. It's fine. Guess what? The deaf community understands. We understand. You know, we're, you know, doing the same thing. We're learning the language as well. So it's a partnership between the two. Like sometimes if we are um, meeting someone and we say, hey, my name is, and whatever that name is, we have to learn that as well. So we're working together with each other, even though it is our first time meeting. So we're still learning. Um, we won't feel, you know, like, oh, I have this down. No, we really appreciate it. We appreciate anyone taking the time to learn our language and culture. We value it because we want you to learn it. That way you can communicate with us and we can communicate with you. We want you to know who we are. We want to work together with you. Um, if you make a mistake, it's fine. You know, you can just ask that person to help me and they would be happy to. That's all, point of, all the point of networking. That's how we learn. Any questions right now? So far, anything? So you just did some basic signs. Um, if you notice what those signs you use, this is all of the features of sign language that you used in those basic signs. Uh, your facial expressions. How are? Um, what's your name? How are you? Facial expressions is key. Uh, 
using the appropriate hand shapes. You know, the alphabets that you are spelling are hand shapes. Uh, the palm orientation. Like if you do G, this is the letter G, you have to put it in the appropriate orientation in order for it to actually be a G. For me, my sign name is Regina on the cheek, so you have to sign it the right way based on the hand movements. Um, if you don't know the sign, you can use gestures like this. If you go to another country, now understand, other countries don't use American Sign Language. So you have, how do you communicate with them? You can start to pick up their language, but originally you have to use gestures to communicate. Then there's classifiers. Usually you see this in story times. Um, for example, if I'm saying outside right now, it's cold. But how cold is it? Uh, yesterday it was really snowy. So, and this is the classifiers that you would use to see how much snow it was. You know, you can say snowing, but you can actually express how much snow it is using classifiers. And then there's the spatial aspect of sign language. Sorry, was that, there a question? I thought I saw someone's hand. So you will notice that all deaf people use this when using sign language. This is used over and over again on a daily basis. Um, spatial expressions will indicate how upset or how happy we are. Um, we also use our body language. These are just very strong features in American Sign Language. Okay, this is the important part that I was looking for how we communicate in the deaf community. Let me ask you this. Are you comfortable with physical contact if you don't know that person? Not comfortable? Not very comfortable? Mm -hmm. So so? Guess what? We use physical contact all the time. It's how we communicate. If I want to get someone's attention, how do I do that? Any ideas? Yep, a tap on the shoulder. Uh, waiting, mm, waiting, not so much, no. <laughs> if I'm sitting here doing something on the board and you're waving at me, how are you gonna get my attention? You're gonna have to touch me, you're gonna have to tap me. So these are another, um, few ways in which we communicate. Um, flashing the lights on and off. This is a way in which we get another deaf person's attention. You know, deaf person, I mean, a hearing person might be like, oh, what's going on? Why are the lights flashing, you know? But for us, like if, if I'm at my job, if you want to get my attention or whatnot, please warn the people, hearing people, that there is a deaf person in the area and this is how you get their attention. That way you do not scare us or make us think that there's an emergency. It's always good to let people who don't know, know. Waiting is okay, but not in the face. We can see you. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, not, not too close, it, and it's rude. If I'm right here and you're, uh, you know, further down, then you can kind of wave, kind of like in my peripheral vision, that's fine. But if you're up close to me, don't put your hand in my face. I might hit you. Uh, I'm purely joking, of course, but. <laughs> uh, stumping on the floor. Maybe you're wondering, well, why? Why would you stump on the floor? It's a pretty solid floor. You might hear a little bit, but some wooden floors have very, very good vibrative tendencies, um, tendency, so. If you hit it like pretty hard, then you will see all of the deaf, deaf people look at you, depending on how hard you stop it. Uh, tables, you can use tables. Like for example, if, I, if somebody over here in the middle of the room wanted to get someone else's attention, knock, you can knock on the table. Let's see if somebody knocks on the table. Go ahead, knock on the table. Louder, louder. Come on, come on. It's okay. 
get comfortable with that feeling, that's how you get our attention as well. It's not awkward for us. We will feel that. And that makes me feel like you're welcoming me. It makes me feel like I'm included and that you want me to be there. Interpreters are also important for us when it comes to communication. Sometimes you'll see me have an interpreter come along with me if I need to speak or communicate with someone. As a deaf person, we always use physical contact. It may not be comfortable for you, it is comfortable for us. A tap, um, if I'm sitting at a table with somebody and you might tap them on the leg, it's okay. It's not physical harassment, it is okay. You know, don't say that someone was trying to flirt with you and they tried, no, it's totally fine. It's just trying to catch my attention or I'm just trying to get your attention. That's the only way because that's how we communicate and it's completely fine. Tapping on an arm is another way in which we get a deaf person's attention. Um, If we're in a hurry, you can reach out and slightly grab the arm. One big experience that I have, or I actually have this experience all the time, and this is when I have interpreters with me, or with you. Uh, when the interpreter is signing, the person who the interpreter is signing for often tries to look at the interpreter and isn't sure where to look. And I will always say, look at the person who you are speaking to. The interpreter are just our ears. Look at me, don't worry about the interpreter. They're just my ears and they're my mouth, that's it. If I'm, if I'm looking at you when you're speaking, you may see me look at the interpreter, but that's because I have to. But when you are speaking to me, look at me. Keep that eye contact with me, that's very important for us. So if you are trying to, if you do have to communicate with a deaf person or a person that is hard of hearing, how do you open up communication with them? How would you do that? To clarify, if you've had experience with a deaf person or a hard of hearing person, what is the best way in which you can communicate with them? Like if you are, So just to clarify, what have you experienced? Have you gone through any awkward situations, any times where you just haven't been able to get a deaf person's attention, but you wanted to, any time that you have maybe had some awkward feelings? Um, what questions do you have in regards to the information currently on the slide? None? Any experience? Some people kind of have a face on that they're not sure if they want to share the thought or not, and that's okay. My sure. experience, I'm not trying to get their attention, but we come into contact with each other, so we, we start a conversation and work out how is that going to go. Like, am I enunciating so they can try to read my lips a little bit? Uh, I worked in an airport, and so a lot of the interactions were gestures, so <laughs> window or aisle. So. Right, that happens often. Oh, another one in the back. So I know enough, I know I have done enough videos to know enough to be dangerous, I think, so I, I feel like I should know more than I do, and what ends up happening is I use up all my ASL and then my brain takes over and I just start gesturing and making up signs that I, I know are not signs, but I'm just, it's just, so it's just embarrassing. <laughs> yes, that happens often as well. If you are receiving a response from a deaf person that they get you, then you're fine, which could be like a head nod. If you're gesturing, that deaf person will kind of try to understand what you're saying, 
and if they're responding appropriately, then you should be okay. We prefer that you ask and try rather than just make something up and maybe pull it out of somewhere. <laughs> Get say I tried. Nah. Ask us. Get the right information rather than just making it up. Because if we see you making it up, we feel like you're mocking us. Again, gesturing is important. Gesturing is unintentionally kind of trying to ask for the right sign, trying to clarify, am I being clear or not? But watch the person's response and you'll see if they understand you or not. Sometimes you'll see a fake smile and a head nod that's like, good for you, okay, goodbye. <laughs> You'll get that often too. So sometimes you'll meet a person who talks a lot and we're in a rush. <laughs> but sometimes it also hurts when we see someone else that we're trying to teach and they walk off on us. That hurts too. So connection is really important. It's okay to know basic signs to find a way to communicate, but eye contact is really key. Welcome that person into the presence of communication. Okay, another one? What was helpful for me was learning the, the word slow. Because I might yes. know the sign, but I don't see the sign. It takes me a long time. Yes. So the sign for slow looks like this. If a person is signing very fast at you and you're like, I can't keep up, go ahead and sign slow. So point yourself and say, me, learn. You can imagine the sign for learn as if there's a piece of paper on your non-dominant hand. It's the same. Another way of interacting without oppression is saying, oh, you're deaf? Let me get a piece of paper and a pen or let's text. Use your phone and text back and forth. You could gesture. You could try spelling out the words that you need to say basic communication. And if you know what deaf person's gonna be here, go ahead and take your time. Look online. There are several apps that you could use. You could use signingsavvy.com. Think about how you're gonna approach that person before that time comes. That way when you meet them, you're good to go. I sometimes will use PSE. So this is an acronym that stands for Pigeon Signed English, which, let me explain that a little bit. We've got ASL, American Sign Language, and then we've got an English-based sign called Signing Exact English. You can imagine them as opposites on a pendulum, and Pigeon Signed English, or PSE, is kind of in the middle. You'll have people in the deaf community that are on all ranges of this continuum. You'll have some people that are very ASL, some people that are using a different mode of communication. Some of them even use what's called cued speech. So it's important to realize that everyone comes from a different background. I lean more towards PSE. My mom didn't really learn sign until my sister was born. She relied on lip reading and speech. And that was in the 1940s. Sign language wasn't as popular back then. It wasn't as accepted. People don't accept their deaf identity right away. Some people say, I'm not deaf, I'm hard hearing. Or, I can hear some, right? Respect their identity, how they want to explain who they are. Just like you would expect a person to tell you what their race is or gender, etc. We're proud of our culture, but some people aren't, and that's okay. That's the beauty of diversity. So when you're working with people in a general setting, just try to give them a warm welcome. Another question here? I'm practicing. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> Thank you.
sometimes. Oh, so I just wanted to explain. Sometimes you'll get that where someone's just kind of practicing to themselves and, and that's okay. <laughs> Uh, driving. Someone just mentioned driving. All right, let me tell you something that just happened to me, and this is an embarrassing story. <laughs> so I was at work at North Central University, and I was ready to go. I knew that I had to get an appointment in the next couple of days, so I used the application on my phone called Marco Polo, or you can also use FaceTime. Is anyone familiar with Marco Polo? Kind of, or are you familiar with FaceTime? All right. So usually people that can hear will go ahead and click their fancy button on a car and speak into it and lo and behold, you're communicating with somebody else, right? We use Marco Polo or FaceTime, which is a face-to-face -face type communication video chat. So while I'm driving, I went ahead and noticed that there was a bus that was kind of coming out in front of me and they were kind of turning. I was like, yeah, I've got some time, all right. Go ahead and click on my phone while I was driving. And I signed a little message to a friend. I knew they were kind of, the bus was trying to turn around or trying to do something. And I thought they were parked at an apartment on the street. I was right off here on Portland Avenue. So I went ahead and did my message and I saw that they were replying for me. And I was okay because that person was still backing out, but I went ahead to reply to that person who replied to me, and lo and behold, that person ran right into my driver's side door. First thing I thought was, why was I driving and signing? Yeah, I mean, I'm proud to be deaf, and I can't speak through the phone, and that's all right, but it is a challenge. I often sign while driving, it can be not so safe to look at a phone because you're missing the road. Yes, that is dangerous, but it's our way of communicating, right? We need visual communication. Everyone who can hear can just turn on their phone and use Bluetooth. We can. So that's, that is one hard part about accessibility is while we're driving. Bummer. All right, any other questions that you guys have? Any thoughts? Just, it can be any random thought. What do you guys, what are you guys thinking about? Um, I'm curious how you see the, I guess, I don't know if you would call it a fight, but for deaf, I don't need culture to be recognized um, and for, and kind of like prepared for and expected in other spaces in society, lining up with other, or not other, but lining up with disability movements that claim the word disability. Just give me one second. <clears throat> We're still fighting every day. Honestly, we're fighting every day. We fight for our rights. We fight for equality. To be hired, it's nonstop. A protest one time is not enough. Ongoing exposure is important. It can take several years, even lifetimes to get through to a person until they recognize that there's a need. We fight until we get the attention. So for example, when I was growing up, I fought every day because I'm not just a woman, I'm black, I'm deaf, I am educated, I'm studying for my PhD, I'm a full-time student, I'm a full-time faculty, I'm a program director at our university. I'm surrounded by people that can hear every day, which means I'm fighting every day. And some people forget that I'm there. Some people forget that a deaf person is there. 
And here we go, rolling up our sleeves when that happens so that we can address it. Will it ever be not a problem? I don't think so. Even though the term hearing impaired is how many years old, people are still using it. It's 2020 and people are still using the inappropriate and old language to talk about someone who is deaf or hard of hearing. How long are we gonna be, be, be fighting that fight? That's a great question. I kind of feel like this is similar to Martin Luther King where he had a dream. I have a dream. One day where deaf and hearing people will come together and they'll support each other and remember it, not just forget it after they met one person. This is common, it's, it's race, it's language, it's culture. But should we give up? No. If you see another person struggling or fighting, don't just stand back and say, I'll pray for you. Do something. Stand up. You might feel like it's not your place. But we are working together. We're fighting for you. You fight for us. That's what the deaf community needs. And please remember that. And don't forget. Right? In your opinion, how can we make the workplace more accessible for uh, deaf employees? There are many things that I can think of. Again, what does that person need is my first question, though. Do they need CART? Do they need an interpreter? So interpreters are very valuable. Um, let's say you're at a doctor's appointment. And that's your work environment in a medical facility. Like, oh, we have to pay for an interpreter? Now nah, we'll just use VRI. Video relay or video remote interpreting where they bring you a little tablet and they try to interpret on that tablet. Can you imagine in a brick-walled hospital setting how great that signal is? Get a live person. <laughs> that would be one way. Again, my question comes down to what does that deaf person want? Do they want CART? Do they want a live interpreter? Maybe they prefer video remote interpreting or VRI. That's fine. I prefer a live interpreter. Uh, another example that I can give you from my own experience. Um, sometimes we're at school where I work and they are strapped for an interpreter. They don't know, they can't get one because it's a last minute meeting. So like, hey, let's use VRI. Eh, that's not access to me. That's not equal access. Because I know that the signal's not gonna be great. They say, oh, can we use CART? Eh, it's not the best option for me either. We just have to make sure that we're planning ahead. So if you're asking for another example of what you can do in the workplace is plan ahead. Have, a, have an idea of what you're gonna do if a deaf person comes or if you already have um, a time that you know you're gonna experience someone in your workplace that is deaf and hard of hearing. We experience some bad interpreters, so it's really important that you get a quality one too. Not someone who is uncertified, who is at a level of ASL one or two. You wanna make sure that you're getting someone that's really skilled. You'll see it on the TV, you'll see it on the news where they're just putting a random person up on that screen to sign and it might be an emergency situation. We don't know what's going on. Are we gonna die soon or are we not? If you don't provide a quality interpreter, that language accessibility is not happening. So interpreters are a great way to provide accessibility in this. They fight for us, we fight for them. Great question. So I'm black, and the, <laughs> and the reason why I'm here is because I'm in a space right now with another black person who is a trans man who's deaf. And every time he talks to me, he's talking to me, to me through a white cisgender woman. 
So I'm trying to communicate with him more directly. Um, and I just wanted to know if there, because we have African American vernacular English, and there are things that I will say to other black people in English that I will not say to a white person or to a white person. So I'm wondering if the same thing exists in ASL and where I can find a resource on that or just talk to other black deaf people on how to communicate better black person to black person. That's a good question. I, I go through that too. I'm black. For example, Carlos, the sign language interpreter, he's black. <laughs> if he doesn't know sign language, I'm going to have to go through Sydney. I was the other interpreter. And I'm like, mm, and she's white. And I have to figure out how to sign with her to make sure that she's speaking in the same sign, signing style that I'm using. I can't just be naturally black and sign because the white interpreter will make it seem very awkward. So, uh, a bl in the black deaf community, there is, you know, a certain style of sign language there. You can meet with them, you can talk with them, um, maybe get with that person that you are speaking to at work and learn from that person. Um, it's, it, the, the communication styles are completely different. Mm -hmm. White interpreters typically have to get a lot more training in order to verbally express the vernacular of a black deaf person, including the personality as well. And that requires being exposed to it, whether it's from other black deaf people or from a black deaf teacher. It's, they have to get all of those exposures. And for me, I mean, I do have my own language. I do have my black American sign language, yeah. You know, you know, I can see that person, I can see their style, I can see that it's different, but I also have to incorporate that. Whereas, it, it depends on where you learn sign language from. You can learn it from a black person, you can learn it from a white person, but you have to also understand that those signing styles will complete, be completely different. And to go through a different style when trying to communicate things can be difficult. Like for example, if you got an interpreter uh, from an agency and you need a black interpreter, it's your right to request a black interpreter. You know, you're not stuck with the interpreter that they provide to you. So it, it's fine and there's nothing wrong with that. You want to make sure that the language fits. You know, you're asking for that type of interpreter for a reason. Uh, because it, it might be a specific situation in which you need that vernacular or need that culture. And, you know, sometimes you may get an interpreter where it's just like, okay, it's okay, but you do have a right to ask for specific interpreters. Okay. No, I don't think I do. I just, I'm just curious because I don't want to be the person that says, you know, I wouldn't quote a Snoop Dogg song through a white interpreter. <laughs> That's why I'm asking. Yeah, unfortunately that happens often. Mm -hmm. Whoa. Whoa. What? <laughs> <laughs> what? Yes, it happens often. Uh, well, that's why I'm here, thank you. Yeah, that's the reason I'm here too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it happens very often, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> how do I explain this? Because um, this is every day because Okay, I'll give you an example. Music, you know, just for an example. You get an interpreter there. You, you have, oh, well, first off, you have the singer is black and you put in a white interpreter and it's nothing against the interpreters, nothing against them personally. Like, they may be a very, very skilled interpreter, very good interpreter, but they do not represent what's being performed. And pers the personality, the attitude, you know, their cultural norms, the vibe is just not the same. And if you can get someone that matches it, it would be better. If not, then everything is missed. It doesn't matter, you know, who that person is. You want representation there. If that person is black, if it's a female, if it's a male, if you want to be able to vibe 
Do you want the interpreter to be able to connect with that person? And it doesn't matter maybe their um, family background. Some people identify with different families, whether you're adopted or not would make a big difference as well. So you have the whole spectrum of how we interact is valuable. And you want that representation to be there. And oftentimes that representation is missing. And that is a part of oppression. Um, we want to have the same access that everyone else has. You have the access, I want the access. Same thing with communicating. You're able to communicate, I want to be able to communicate with you as well. It's a two-way street. I mean, I don't want an interpreter to be here interpreting something that they don't believe, trying to portray that, you know, something that I believe that they don't believe. I think it's contra contradictory, if that makes sense. Okay, thank you, good question. <laughs> You mentioned agencies for interpreters. Is there access information about different agencies on the Minnesota Access Alliance, or do you have a couple that you recommend? There's tons of agencies, especially here in Minnesota. There's ASLIS. Uh, is anyone writing it down? It's ASLIS. There's K-I-S, what is the acronym? Keystone Interpreting Services. There's also... Hi, this is Gina, one of the board members of MNA. I just wanted to say that we do have a list that another board member, John, has compiled that we can share with everybody who is registered for this workshop. We don't publish it online at this point because we haven't gotten permission from all of the the service providers that we've worked with um, uh, in the past. So um, we can do that. So as you're, as you're listing off, these are some of the two that are on our list as well. Yeah, I use a total of, let's see, that's what I Wow, maybe I just use those two more than the others, but th there's a lot of them. There's a lot of them, and um, I do work with them and but the two that I just listed are the ones I'm most familiar with. What is a good way to let um, the deaf community know that services are available? What's the appropriate way to communicate that? <laughs> For instance, I'm in theater, so um, we, we always have at least a couple performances that are interpreted, but what's the best way to let the deaf community know that you are providing services? Good question. I'm actually a theater interpreter as well. Um, I actually work with the Guthrie. I just started working with a couple of other theaters, and again, the promotions for that is usually done on Facebook or any type of social media. Uh, there are different organizations like RID, the Registry of Interpreters for the Deaf. There's newsletters. There's, there's some, quite a few ways in which you can get the info out there. Um, how to get deaf people to receive the information. Most of the time, Facebook or some form of social media spreads quite a bit faster. And then you can also, you know, let them know that there's gonna be interpreters there. And like I know Guthrie and Orderway, those are the two that I have experience with, but there's tons of uh, theaters out there that a lot of deaf people don't know provides those services. So word of mouth, uh, newsletters, social media, just get it out there. Um, that's usually how we get most of our information. Any other questions? If an organization is showing a movie that is or is not captioned, what is the best way that we can welcome deaf people to attend that movie? So there's usually one thing that's called open captions. Um, they usually do that on specific days for the deaf community, and you'll see a flood of deaf people go there. 
but um, sometimes it's just random movies. But the thing is, it's kind of hard because the devices are not the greatest. We often get frustrated with it because many open captions, uh, movie theaters, just in general, a lot of it isn't accurate. I don't know, maybe it's the signal is not really great or... Yeah, I, I would prefer it to have open caption for that specific movie. But if you, and if you do have something that's set up like that, then you'll get a lot of deaf people to come there for something that's specifically set up or established for it. But just open caption the movies, it, the, the, it, it's not the best. It's not the best. Just to clarify, open captions is always the best way to go about providing a movie. Also, I wanted to mention really quick about YouTube videos. YouTube videos are not great with their automatic closed captioning. You'll notice that some of them say, yeah, we have closed captioned, but check it out first. Right now we've got cart captioning. You see that there's coherent sentences. You see that there's punctuation, etc. So that's a great way too. Um, but showing a movie, um, creating a video, there's not necessarily any perfect way to get it accessible. We're still fighting for that right. So there was one question that was asked. What do you do if you do not remember signs? Like I said, you can use an ASL app. You can look on YouTube. Um, there's different websites. Um, just practice. Um, also, just hanging out or getting around the deaf community. Go to deaf events. Go to deaf conferences. Go to workshops like this. Uh, any type of way to get exposed to the language, or exposed to the culture, will improve your communication. It's how you remember it. It's how you remember your signs. I think we're at time now. Yeah. Okay, so I think, um, is there a PowerPoint that's supposed to be sent out um, that everyone can look at. Um, I wish I could have went through all of the slides with you, but if you have any questions, please contact her. Contact me. Um, you can contact me via email. I'll be great. It will be great to hear from you. And I just want to thank everyone. And hopefully, you all can keep learning and practice your signing. Don't stop. <laughs> thank you. Our interpreters and our cart captioner and our videographer. Um, for being here today. Uh, Regina mentioned we'll share some resources um, to anyone who's registered for the event. Um, if you did not register, just come see me before you leave and I'll write down your email address if you'd like um, a copy of the handout or Regina's slides um, for today. Uh, again, good job Janine for remembering these things. Also, um, I think Scott wanted to share a bit about a resource that also is in the back of the room. Uh, if you wouldn't mind coming up. Yeah. Great. And maybe standing on this side. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'm Scott Hartley. I'm the Accessibility Program Director at the Metropolitan Regional Arts Council. And we just released guidelines um, that Bart is showing in the back there for an access improvement grant. This is open to organizations uh, with arts programming expenses under $1 million a year. Um, I'd love to get this in the hands of more organizations to do access, to do access work. Uh, so feel free to come chat with me if you uh, have ideas or want to chat more about it. Thank you. Anything else to share? Oh, nice. Jesse is in the back with surveys. Ooh, I did not get everything on my list. That's all right. So we've got paper surveys here if you'd like to take them today or otherwise. Everybody who registered will receive an email and you can also take it through survey. So that's to help us learn a little bit more about your thoughts on this event. Okay. I think we're at time. Thank you again so much for coming. Have a 
safe and easy rest of the day. Take care.